Right. Um, again, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody that has uh, visited us several times and has always left us with a smile on our faces. So, uh, David Spencer. Dobro jutro, is that correct? That, that's, that's all I know, okay? I confess, it's all I know. Um, obviously, I'm in a very uh, important section here between coffee, which is very, very important, and lunch, which is even more important. I'll try to be fast so that you can enjoy coffee and lunch with all its time. Uh, this is my second visit to Serbia, to Belgrade. The first time was in 2016. I can see from your faces that you're too young to remember that time. Um, just a very quick introduction, very quick. Uh, so my name is Dave Spencer. Uh, I am from Liverpool, the home of the Beatles. Um, I live, in fact, in Madrid, in Spain. And I teach, and I still teach in Spain every day. Uh, and I also write books, so I wrote uh, Gateway, Gateway Second Edition. Uh, today, in this session, what we're going to look at is critical thinking and critical reading, uh, particularly with teenagers, but in fact, many of the ideas that I suggest I think will be fine for younger students and definitely for adults. Now, I'm going to um, begin the session uh, with some amazing news. I don't know if you've seen this news, okay? breaking news at the moment, and uh, how have scientists really found a gigantic crystal pyramid under the Bermuda Triangle? That is the amazing news that is in the news at the moment. What do you think? Have they found uh, a, a crystal pyramid? People are saying no. I have photographic evidence which can maybe persuade you, okay? Look, that, that looks, no, people are still saying no. Well, I even have a text, okay? So I've got a text which is explaining all about it. You don't need to read it, but it is explaining that this scientist, his name is apparently uh, Dr. Verlag Meyer. He's found these pyramids made of crystal, uh, two meters thick, I think. There's also a glowing crystal at the top. Uh, and it talks about some British scientists who've seen the same thing. So are you convinced now that it's true? M maybe we do have a text, but some people are still saying no. My interest in critical reading began with my daughter. Uh, my daughter was 14 years old, and she suddenly came up and said, Dad, have you read this amazing story about these amazing pyramids? And I thought, my daughter is very intelligent. I mean, you know, obviously, I have to say that, and it's true. She's very intelligent, and I'm thinking, how could she possibly believe that this is true? And then it did occur to me that it is true that I think the new generation of teenagers, all of the news that they see comes on the internet. And there's news about all sorts of things, all sorts of people. Some of it is incredible and true. Some of it is boring and true. And some of it is incredible and not true. And how do you know which is which? Now, obviously, as an adult, we tend to have like more experience of the world. We have a bigger filter. We have, um, maybe we just think more, but we decide, well, this can't be true. Uh, and we sort of have reasons why we think something is not true. But my daughter didn't really have that experience. And so I suddenly realized, how do I persuade her that it is in fact not true, because how do you do that? Now, um, this in fact, just so that you know, this text is a genuine fake text, okay? So it appears in uh, Gateway Second Edition A2, but it is real, and if you look on the internet, if you search on the internet, Crystal Pyramids, Bermuda Triangle, Dr. Verlag Mayer even, you will find this story. So it's around and lots of people can see it. Um, how? Can you persuade somebody that it's not true, apart from just saying, well, it's rubbish? Okay, so how can you do that? Well, um, I sort of did some research and came up with this checklist. One thing, uh, today I'm going to show you lots of texts, but the ideas that I uh, show about how to uh, 
think about critical thinking, critical reading, you could use with any text. So this checklist is a great checklist for any story you read on the internet. So how, how can you find out if it's true or not? One thing, you can uh, look at who are the people mentioned in the text. I mentioned Dr. Verlag Mayer. And in fact, if you search for him on Google, he only ever appears in this story. He never appears anywhere else, okay? So that is already a kind of key that something is wrong. The next question, it talks about, in my text before, it talked about British scientists, Japanese experts, but it never says who they are. And if you don't know who they are, then they could be anybody. Who are these people? So try and find out, are they from a university? Are they from a government? Are they from sort of hospital? Who are these experts? Who wrote the text? Um, at the bottom of my text, it doesn't actually say. It doesn't even give a source. It gives a link, and when you click on the link, it doesn't take you anywhere. That, again, is very suspicious. So actually having that, um, the author, Google the author. Who is it? Is it a journalist? Is it somebody who's written lots of other um, articles? Who is the person involved? What's the website? Okay, so does it say it's from the BBC? Is it from the Guardian? Is it from a French newspaper? Where is the text actually from? And who created it? The places in the text, do they exist? So my crystal pyramids, it only really talks about the Bermuda Triangle. Does the Bermuda Triangle really exist? Well, no, not scientifically, it doesn't. Uh, so that's a good place to start as well. Are the places actually real? Scientific language, so in my text it talks about quantum crystals. Well, if you search for quantum crystals, you don't get much serious information. So again, we're discovering that in fact that is not really scientific, it's pseudoscience. Photographic evidence, well, I showed you the photographic evidence before, but you weren't convinced. What do you think that photograph actually showed? It was basically the uh, Egyptian pyramids, no, the great pyramids of Giza, and they were made to look blue, like they were underwater, but they weren't actually any different from the Egyptian pyramids. And the, finally then, the source, is it actually like a scientific website? Is it a newspaper website? Is it a television channel? Where is it actually come from? And basically, I would suggest, uh, and by the way, we will be sharing, I think, the PDFs of this session um, after the conference, so you can look at this, this checklist and use it with any text. I think that after looking at those eight questions, we can prove that, in fact, these crystal pyramids under the water don't actually exist. In fact, I did some investigation, and this story, it's still on the internet now, but it's actually really, really old. It's from 1991, uh, so it actually didn't appear originally on the internet. It appeared in a Canadian satirical newspaper uh, called the Daily World News, and um, I just wanted to share this with you because the top story is husband snoring kills wife. And I just wanted to point out that with the crystal pyramids, I had to persuade my daughter that the story was not true. To persuade my wife that this story was not true was actually much more difficult. So she, she definitely believed that snoring could kill her, I think, in this case. By the way, when people complain about people who snore, it's because they're awake while you're sleeping. But while the other person is awake, while you are awake, sorry, and the other person is sleeping, you also find that the other person snores. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Although I snore, I'm not the only one. I like the other story too, okay? Woman wins big bingo jackpot and drops dead. I think it's probably possible. <laughs> okay, so this story, Crystal Pyramids, we've decided it's not true. So, the talk is about critical thinking, and the question is, what is critical thinking? And, in fact, many experts will tell you that there is no serious good definition of what critical thinking really exactly is. So I thought I'd start with talking about what is uncritical thinking, which is maybe easier to define. So uncritical thinking, as it says here, uh, if the suggestion that occurs is at once accepted, we have uncritical thinking, the minimum of reflection. And I think that's possibly the problem, right, with our students or with teenagers, is that you read something and it is automatically true. 
you just read it, and whatever you read is true. That would be uncritical thinking. Uh, the opposite, then, would be critical thinking. So this is a definition. I'll show you who it's from in a second. To turn the thing over in the mind, to reflect, means to hunt for additional evidence for new data that will develop the suggestion and will either bear it out or else make obvious its absurdity and irrelevance. Two things I think are important there. One is the turning it over in your mind. So basically, critical thinking is thinking. When you read something, think about it. Does it sound like it makes sense? Does it not make sense? And the next thing to do is to try and find out more evidence. And that's what we did with the Crystal Pyramids text. We tried to look, think, where could I find out more information about this, which proves that it's true or proves that it's not true, okay? Um, this is actually from John Dewey, that you might well know the name, uh, American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer, and that is 1910. And I always think it's interesting when we talk about new innovations in ELT, they're often actually really, really old, okay? So we've been talking about critical thinking for over 100 years or more. Um, but I like this definition. It's basically saying, uncritical thinking, you believe anything, critical thinking, you think about it, you reflect on it, and you try to find out more information. So, my next questions, which are pretty obvious questions, are why is critical thinking important? And after your coffee, I'm sure you've got lots of brain power, I'm gonna give you two minutes with your partner. Can you think of any reasons why critical thinking is important? Maybe it's the question is so obvious that you think, but have a quick discussion, okay? Why is it so important? Two minutes with your partner. Okay. Um, I imagine we have a few ideas. Would anybody like to shout out one basic idea that they maybe had? Lying. Survival. Right, so actually, um, you know, if you're going to be faced with so many texts all the time on the internet, it is actually a question of survival to find out, you know, what is, what am I meant to believe here? What am I not meant to believe? Um, there are so many stories that are fake. My crystal pyramid story is a stupid story, but there are many political stories, many stories which are more important, uh, where students have to decide what is true and what is not. Just one more idea that anybody would like to share? Say that again. Manipulation, okay, right, so the same idea, yeah, in a way that people could be fooling you and taking advantage of you by telling you something that is clearly not true. Uh, here are a few ideas that I've sort of come up with. Um, first one then is this idea, which maybe we've mentioned slightly, autonomy and independence. Thinking for yourself, which is a question of survival. Um, now, this is just, we could discuss this for the next week, okay? But I'm going to divide education into two sort of um, styles of teaching. This first style is the style that I personally, when I grew up as a boy in Liverpool, this is definitely the style of education that I had. Uh, memorizing facts. Now, you can nod your heads or shake your heads if it was similar for you uh, when you were learning in your Serbian school. But basically, we spent our time memorizing things, memorizing dates, places, names. That's generally what we did. Retaining knowledge. So the teacher would give you this knowledge, they would hand it over, it would come maybe through a book, through a lecture, and you would need to remember it, and remember it forever, or at least until your next exam. Um, the students, the idea was the student is basically coming along, they're not bringing anything, they are just empty vessels, they're empty jars, and the teacher would fill them with this information. And um, in a way, I would sort of describe it as surface learning. One example, and this is actually the way that literature is still taught in Spain, in my school, is that the students learn when Cervantes was born, when he died, which were his main works, when he wrote them, what style of writing it is considered to be. But you wouldn't actually, they don't actually even read much of what he actually wrote. So you're learning these facts, but you're not actually going underneath the facts. And I think we could contrast that with an idea of a maybe more progressive style of education, where what we're saying is in a way the opposite. So the teacher is questioning the students, getting them to think, so why do you say that? What is the purpose of this? 
And we're encouraging our students to ask questions too. I always think there's nothing better than a good question from a student because it proves that they're thinking about what you are explaining. Um, hands-on, experiential. So the students are doing things. Maybe they're making things. Maybe they're writing things, but they're creating things. They're not simply receiving them. The student is a participant in the uh, educational process. They're not just um, passive recipients of knowledge. And we've got deeper learning and understanding. We're asking the students to understand the principles of what we're teaching. Now, I think that this is very much, this later slide is what many people uh, would consider to be a great way of teaching today. Getting students to be thinking about what they're doing, getting them to question what they're learning, and to be active participants. I think maybe we could say that the best form of education is possibly a mixture of the two, because receiving information from the teacher is actually a really useful thing. Uh, shortcut to information. But I think that basically critical thinking is part of this concept of education where we're asking students to think about what we are telling them and to even um, question it afterwards. Second reason why critical thinking is so important is what we've already mentioned a few times, fake news. So we're talking about manipulation, we're talking about incorrect information, and I think our students need to be ready for this more and more. Another thing then is um, thinking as part of education. We all know about the PISA exams. Um, you know that basically it's sort of maths and reading, but now, as from 2022, there is a creative thinking examination to compare how well students are learning to think uh, in different countries, which is interesting. Um, this is a very recent article uh, from the summer 2022. Tony Blair, ex-Prime Minister, his institute recommends that we should change all of our exams and they should be dealing with digital skills, thinking skills, creative thinking, because the idea is that these things are useful in life after school, which I'll come back to in a second. But here's a, like a more concrete example. Um, this is the Spanish, this is what I spend my life doing, okay? This is the Spanish university entrance exam. Don't look at it too hard because it's terrible, okay? It's a really bad exam. But you'll notice the essay at the bottom, okay? Write an essay on this topic. What should local authorities do to improve transport and mobility in large cities? I asked my students to do this essay uh, one day when I was away, when I came back, they wanted to kill me. Because basically they said, we can't do this in Spanish, how can we do it in English? And most politicians cannot solve the problem of transport in large cities. So we're asking 17-year-olds to do this. The evaluation is quite, there are three points for the essay, three points, and we've got 0.5 is if the message is clear, precise, and coherent with interesting ideas and relevance to the question, and the candidate can develop a personal point of view with original opinions which are adequately backed up. That has very little to do with English, right? It has to do with the person as a whole human being. And so the point would be, and I do believe this is true now, in our English lessons, we need to be teaching thinking skills so that students can answer these questions. If your students try to do Cambridge Advanced, they probably have sufficient English and not sufficient experience of the world. And so by teaching them critical thinking, creative thinking, collaborative thinking, maybe we can help them to answer these questions. So I think critical thinking is actually part also of evaluation. And then I think it's also a question of thinking skills. Somebody said survival, right? I mean, I think this is the same. Students need to be able to think critically to do any university course, I would say. And also, it is important as a life skill. They need to be able to think critically in many areas of their lives. Right, now, at the moment, you might be thinking, okay, this is fine. By the way, you don't look like this. I just want to make that clear. You don't like that. You could look like this, but you don't. But you might be thinking, okay, I know that critical thinking, I know what it is, and I know that it's important, but how do I do it in my lessons, right? That's what I'm going to be talking about for the next half an hour. Um, 
how can we teach critical thinking in the classroom with teenagers, as I say, also maybe upper primary and certainly with adults? All of the activities that I show will be based on Gateway Second Edition and Gateway to the World, but I'll say it again, it doesn't matter what text you use, you can use these strategies with any type of text. The first thing, uh, so we're gonna divide these critical thinking skills into different areas. The first one really, uh, separating fact from fake, we've talked about it already. And I would suggest that this checklist is a great way to separate what is fact and what is fake. So use that checklist, use it with your students, see if they can find out the source of the information, where it came from. Um, the interesting thing then is that we're not just talking about texts. There is a new thing, I'm sure you've heard about this, uh, visual literacy. And I think this is really fascinating uh, because that photograph of the crystal pyramids, that's an example of, uh, you know, is that, not just is a text real, but is the photograph real or is it fake? And there's a nice thinking routine from Harvard Graduate School of Education, which is called See, Think, Wonder, which you might know. Uh, have a look at this because you're going to put it into practice in a second, okay? So the first thing is, what do you see? So describe. Simply describe what you can see, okay? So you're not uh, using any subjectivity. You're simply describing objectively what there is in a photograph. Then you are thinking about what it might be. So what maybe is this photograph showing? So you're speculating. And then the next question is, what do you wonder about it? So what do you wonder about where it came from, what it might be, and how can you find out more? How can you find out what the photo is actually showing? Can you find similar photos? Um, how can you uh, discover more about what it is? Okay, we're gonna do that now. I hope that, yeah, I think that photograph is pretty clear, even hopefully from the back. Just two minutes with your partner, I want you to do that see, think, wonder. So first of all, objectively describe what you can see, then discuss what you think it might be, and then what else would you like to know about the photo, okay? Two minutes. Okay, um, objectively, if you had to describe it, you might say that it's like 30 small individual pictures. They seem to have like numbers or letters underneath. Um, and also there seem to be pins here holding the things together. What do you think it is? Or what do you think they are? Sorry? Somebody thinks they're cornflakes. Does anybody else have another theory? Well, actually, you're totally correct. It's cornflakes. Yeah? Very good, yes. I think that does deserve a round of applause, actually, for the cornflakes. But... Good, good. Does anybody know which brand they are? Um... Okay, they are cornflakes, and they are pinned to these black things, and they've got numbers and letters behind them. Does, what, what, does anybody else, does anybody think any further about what this could be? Or why, so wondering, why is it? What, what are you wondering right now? <laughs> Probably about many things. About, I suppose the question is why? Why would you stick this? these cornflakes on the, well, I'm gonna tell you, this is actually a work of art. And I think, I can't remember the, how much it was bought for, but I think it was like a thousand pounds. Okay, if you're ever bored at breakfast, to start sticking cornflakes on pieces of paper, you might make a thousand pounds. It's actually, um, this is from a text. We've got lots of different works of art and they are all based on uh, food. And this lady, this artist, she had the idea. I, I personally love this as a work of art. Her point was that you can take an everyday object and put it in a different context. The idea of putting them as if they are expensive items, as if they're worth something, 
with a specific name and a specific number makes you wonder what is it, what is a cornflake? Each one, by the way, of course, her point is, each cornflake is unique, okay, like a snowflake. And um, it makes you think, what is art? Can cornflakes be art? Yes or no? So this is just a, a lovely picture to get students thinking about even something very deep. So from a picture of 30 cornflakes, we're asking, what is art? Um, now, one thing about this, and this was the title, it is the title of my session, what makes you say that? I would suggest that you ask that question to your students a lot. So when we get their opinion, when they give their opinion saying that's stupid, okay, what makes you say that? Many people say modern art is rubbish, okay, but that actually isn't very expressive. What makes you say that modern art is rubbish? And this idea of um, justifying your opinions, you remember my Spanish exam, uh, it said that 0 0.5 was explaining why you think what you think. And I think we could often say in English lessons, your opinion sometimes doesn't matter. What matters is that you have some kind of justification. And I think as part of growing up as a teenager, this is part of our job as teachers, is to get students thinking about what they're saying and why they are saying it. So this question, what makes you say that, I think is a powerful question. And you'll notice that we're saying, use ideas in the text and or other facts, opinions and experiences to justify your opinion. We are training students to think, okay, I think it's stupid. Okay, is there anything in the text that sort of backs you up or is saying the opposite? Um, do you know any other works of art that you think are stupid or very good and why? So in, in other words, we're encouraging this uh, reflection, we're encouraging turning over in the mind. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about the internet, it's full of photos that again, we need, somebody said the word manipulation, we need to think, is this image manipulated or not? This is actually a photograph from my latest book, Gateway to the World, and I suddenly realized afterwards that it could be confusing. So this is the kind of photo you'd like to investigate, because I know that the Houses of Parliament have never been submerged, but I'm not sure that my students could believe that this is a real image. And there are ways with this see, think, wonder, what can you see, what do you think it shows, what do you wonder, they usually wonder, is it true or not? And how can you find out? Google it. Houses of Parliament submerged. Actually, I think they are submerged, <laughs> but from the inside, from the river. But not as bad as this, okay? And it has nothing to do with climate change. But basically getting students to experiment and to investigate. Now, um, there's a great image recently that some of you may have seen this uh, famous French professor, Etienne Klein. You know the James Webb Telescope, which is taking amazing photographs of the universe? He took this photograph of this, uh, what's it called, Proxima Centauri, the star that's closest to the sun. Um, and here it is. And, you know, if you, if you described it, what color is this planet? Red, looks a bit like... Look, does it look like another planet that you know? Well, it's a star, but does it look like a planet? It looks a bit like Mars, okay? Uh, don't sort of shout out, but sort of like maybe nod your head if you know what this photo... Okay, well, this photo, this is one of my favorite photos of all time. This is not Proxima Centauri. This is a slice of chorizo. This is sausage, okay? Basically... It is sausage. It's pretty good, isn't it? And um, it's a real, again, it's a real fake story. So this professor, and this is an interesting question. So we're laughing and then it's worth thinking. This was published in a real scientific journal. And this professor had to apologize later because it caused such a scandal. Because the scientific journal itself was showing this photograph as the planet Proxima Centauri and it is a slice of chuddy film, okay? Um, so it makes you wonder what we're seeing and what students are being bombarded with is lots of information, and adults, lots of information that we need to check out if it's true or not. I did some investigation, and after the chorizo, the sausage episode, I found another good one. This is another real one, and this is before the sausage photograph, okay? I, I like this, I'm intrigued. If anybody gets this right, you deserve a round of applause and my lifetime uh, 
just like appreciation because NASA, okay, they, in 2015, they showed uh, how many pictures? Nine pictures, and you have to decide which one is Europa's moon and which ones are frying pans, okay? Here we go. <laughs> this is real, okay? Have a quick look, and you're going to tell me which one you think is actually Europa. Right. Would it, does anybody think it's on the top line? Okay, does anybody think it's on the middle line? You're being very cautious. And the third line? People think it's the third line. If it's on the third line, which one do you think is the real one? The first one, this one. How many people think this one? Put your hands up very quickly. Only one or two, okay. This one? This one? This one? That is the one. So a few of you do deserve a round of applause. Okay, you did actually get it right, well done. And apparently, if we have any experts in astronomy in the room, I'm not an expert, apparently it's obvious. <laughs> and it's obvious because it has red canals. It's the only one that has red canals. And the other ones are frying pans, but they're actually very, again, very artistic frying pans, right? Okay, um, so visual literacy, uh, simply questioning what we can see, what is it really? And uh, I suggest then that see, think, wonder. What do you see, what do you think it is, and what are you wondering next? Um, a very basic, again, critical reading skill is we've talked about this, uh, differentiating fact and fiction. Now we're talking about differenti differentiating fact and opinion. Um, just to do this, uh, we're going we're gonna to read, well, you're not going to read, I'm going to explain a little text about the White House. Uh, quick quiz, how many bathrooms does the White House have? Anybody think more than 20? More than 30? It's actually 35, okay? 35 bathrooms. What's special about the desk in the old Oval Office? Does anybody know? History expert? <laughs> it's not oval. It's true, it's not oval. It was actually a gift from Queen Victoria, and it was made from a, a ship that sank in 1850, okay? What sport does some president... Let's keep this clean, okay? What sports does some presidents play in the Oval Office? No bad answers. It's golf, okay? It's golf, and there are four doors in the Oval Office. One takes you to a private dining room, Two to the West Wing. The fourth one takes you to? <laughs> it takes you to a garden. It takes you to the Rose Garden, okay? Now, um, basically, what I've got here is a text. This is from Gateway 2nd Edition A2, and it is inside the uh, White House, and basically, it's explaining, more or less, the things that we've just talked about. So this is a very easy, clear text to get your students thinking about two things. What is fact? What is opinion? And in this text, you don't need to read it, but basically it's saying what the different rooms are, when it was built, how big it is, what different features it has. Some texts are more difficult to appreciate if it is actually fact or opinion. Sometimes we've got them mixed. But basically, I think that question, particularly if it is a text all based around somebody's opinion, it's a useful question to ask your students. When they've finished reading a text, is this text mainly talking about facts or is it mainly talking about opinions? And that actually takes us to another uh, reading skill that we can use, thinking about text types and sources. And I think this is very important for the internet. There are lots of different text types, and this influences the way that we read them, and also maybe how much we believe them, or we don't believe them, or we trust them, or we don't trust them. Uh, what we've got here is a forum. So this is useful for, again, our teenage students who are probably often reading things like forums. And it's giving opinions about a school, a real school called the Brit School. We've got different entries on this forum. Um, and then we've got a question. And I would like you to answer this question just for two minutes. What are the advantages and disadvantages of an internet forum? Okay, so... Consulting a forum, it can be really useful 
it could also not be so useful. Just for two minutes, can you just quickly chat to your partner? What could be useful or not so useful about consulting an internet forum? Okay. Okay, um, could sh somebody shout out one advantage of an internet forum? What is good about a forum? So you get better insights because often a forum will be people who are replying who know about this particular topic. It could be about a restaurant, right? So we're getting a forum. What do people really think about this restaurant? And the people who are writing are normal people, average people, not maybe uh, some kind of person who has got some special interest, but uh, a forum will generally be the general public who are writing, okay? So I think that's a major advantage. What is a disadvantage? Sorry? Subjectivity. And I think this is really important for teenagers. And of course, on forums, we do also have like extremely negative comments. We have very hurtful, harmful comments. This whole question of who is writing this? I mean, we don't really know them. They seem to be normal people, but we can't really tell. Actually, even on a restaurant review, maybe it's the owner of the restaurant who's saying that the restaurant is the best restaurant in Belgrade, so we don't know. People could be lying about who they are. And I think, I hope I'm sort of convincing you if you're not convinced already, these are in a way, they're more important in a way than the comprehension questions that we always ask our students. We ask our students if, this, if the information is true or false, or we ask them a general comprehension question. What does this person say about X, Y, or Z? I would suggest that these types of questions are really important for our teenage students to work out, you know, is this, uh, how, how reliable is this text? Wikipedia, uh, the whole question about Wikipedia, how reliable is Wikipedia? So yes, it has, and this is, by the way, I, I will come to this at the end, this is not black and white, this is not saying a forum is bad or good, or Wikipedia is good or bad. What we're trying to do is to think about what are the good things and what are the less good things so that students can approach these texts carefully. Okay, um, another key point that I'm not gonna spend too long talking about, but one uh, useful critical reading skill is summarizing key points in a text. Um, and so again, here we've got different short texts about ha how happy students are in different countries in the world, teenagers. We've got people expressing their opinion about that survey. I think it happens every year, UNICEF. Uh, Finland, I think, is always the country where it seems to be students are the happiest. Um, but it's getting, the important thing is just this question here. Write one or two sentences to summarize what each person thinks and are they giving facts or opinions? So again, we're mixing two things, facts and opinions, but also summarizing. And I think summarizing is something that we don't do enough. Uh, usually at university, summarizing is a key skill. And I think it's really useful to get students used to deciding what is the main point that this person is making. So summarizing and then deciding um, uh, true, uh, sorry, fact or opinion. Um, another thing that is, uh, I think, really useful for teenage students is this idea of um, responsible research on the internet. Um, so we've got, these are from Gateway to the World, the latest edition of Gateway, but it's looking at things like um, what we mentioned with our Crystal Pyramids text. When they Students often do projects, right, in class, and they often have to find out information. Get the students used to thinking about how reliable the source is. So what is the source? Um, is it the BBC or is it some local news source? Where has the information come from? This is useful, I think, again, for students to start thinking about uh, the URL when they look for information. So of course there are different um, protocols, I suppose you could call them, uh, 
to decide when they look at something on the internet, which country is it from? Is it from a government agency? Is it from a university? Is it an academic institution in general? And just looking at the URL will tell the students a lot about the type of information that they are finding. And then finally, uh, this one, when you find a piece of information that you want to use in your project, search for at least one other source that confirms that information. That is a really useful skill again. So they can find out, you can find out anything on the internet, but is it just one person saying it or not? By the way, you might be interested to know that when I write books now, today, for any piece of information, I always have to give three different sources of information to justify what I am saying. Otherwise, they will not print it in an English language course book. So I think this whole concept of being able to find some type of confirmation, not just one piece of information on the internet. Okay. Um, We've talked about this already a little bit, so I'm going to go pass over this quite quickly uh, with this idea of what makes you say that. So um, this is a text about the idea of school, should school start later for teenagers? Does anybody know the main argument for sc starting school later for teenagers? It's about sort of sleep cycles that teenagers, apparently it's been proved that the way that they their brains work, that they're... Uh, their daily routine, they tend to have to sleep, they go to sleep later, and therefore they should get up later. This is a text all about that, and in fact in many countries, California was the latest country, I think uh, latest area, about a month ago to change so that school starts later. Um, and apparently results are generally better when teenagers start school later rather than earlier. By the way, later and earlier is very relative because I think Korea, it's like about seven o'clock in the morning. So for them, eight o'clock is late. What time did your school start? Eight. See, that's early for me. I start at 8.45 and even that is difficult for me. I think school should start later for me because I'm old. Um, but then asking the students at the end, okay? So uh, should... So with the, the, the title of the text is, should school start late for teenagers? Let's ask the students what they think. But again, we're not just saying, yes, I think it should start earlier. My point would be that you have to ask this question, what makes you say that? So justify your opinion, back your opinion up, okay? Um, I've mentioned that twice now because I think it's the easiest and in many ways the most useful strategy that we can use. Um, I think I've got two or three different more strategies to mention quickly. One of them then is this idea of going beyond your first impressions. Now, um, do you all know about the Ig Nobel Prizes? These prizes, I love this. I mean, these, the idea of the Ig Nobel Prizes, they are scientific prizes, but they're given to honor research that first make people laugh and then make them think. And that's what I'm suggesting here. Our automatic reaction might be to laugh, but there is maybe something serious which is happening. Um, this again is from Gateway Second Edition. Um, what happens when you hear what you are saying just a few milliseconds after you say it? Do you know? So you imagine you're speaking and you can automatically hear yourself just a little bit slightly later. Do you know what happens? What happens is that you can't speak properly because you start like hearing feedback and you start slurring your words and you have to stop speaking, okay? That's actually what happens. Um, and just the fourth question, who produces more milk? Cows with names or cows without names? Serious question, well, not a serious question, but any idea? What would you say? With, who thinks with? Who, who thinks without? Well, that's funny. So some of you don't think anything at all. Let, let's just... Let's just try that again. You're not going to miss lunch, okay, if you get the wrong answer. How many people think that cows with names produce more milk? Okay. And without? Okay. There's still a few people who don't think anything. The answer is with names. Of course. Well, of course, Greg, but why? Why is that then? <laughs> The owner treats them better. So this is, this is the point. There are many texts where we have an initial reaction. The Ig Nobel Prizes are great for this because they just sound stupid. 
But actually, there is maybe something here, right? That uh, mass, you know, enormous sized farms maybe are worse because there is no contact. There's no personal care maybe for the animals. And so there's something there for us to think about, okay? So uh, why is it that this would be the case? Um, so first reactions and going beyond first reactions. Uh, this is another one of those, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. This is another one of those stories that, have you heard this story before about Nobel Prizes and chocolate? This was a story that, again, went all around the world in very, very serious publications. This professor, he drew a graph of how much chocolate different countries produced, and then a different graph of those countries, how many Nobel Prizes did they win? What did the graph show? The graph showed, the two graphs showed, that there was an enormous correlation between the amount of chocolate and Nobel Prizes. Okay. This professor was actually writing a joke. He knew it was stupid. Why is it stupid? Well, not stupid, maybe, but why is it, why is it, is it true then that the more chocolate you eat, the more chance you will get a Nobel Prize? Actually, I know a lot of people that is definitely not true. Last night in the restaurant, we had a, a dessert which was called Death by Chocolate. It should have been called Nobel Prize by chocolate. All it is, it's not causality, right? So all it was showing was maybe some of the countries which are richer, where the consumption of chocolate is higher because people have more money, also coincides that they maybe have more money for research too. In fact, this professor, he published it in a scientific journal as a joke, and immediately all of the news channels around the world started to tell the story as if it was true. Okay, um, so again, the idea is a little bit like with the visual literacy, we've got information, but what we have to do is not just take the first impression, but go a little bit deeper. And I think, yeah, I'm going to explain this. No, in fact, I'm not going to explain this. Right, this is my last point, and then I'm going to start summing up. Um, I think that the thing with critical thinking is that it does lead us to some very slippery questions. Slippery, I mean that there is no easy wrong or right answer. This is a text uh, which is about the terrible, there was a terrorist attack in San Bernardino, and I can't remember which year, in California. And I don't know if anybody remembers this attack, but they caught the terrorist who'd done this killing and they got their iPhones. And the FBI told Apple that they had to explain their security protocol on the iPhone so that they could find out information from this terrorist phone if there were more people involved. And the head of Apple refused to do that. And he refused to do it because he said that this was breaching the whole security protocol for everybody. Now, this question, I think, is an interesting question because some people have very strong reactions saying, well, yeah, but they're terrorists, so we have to find out this information. When we think about it more, there is another side, which is it means that the FBI could access all information about all of us from our phones. In the end, the F uh, sorry, Apple did not give permission, but the FBI managed to work out how to get inside the terrorist's phone. Interestingly, in America, 50% of the population were asked about this question in a survey, and they said 50% said that it was the wrong decision, 45% said it was the right decision, which is actually a very close percentage. The point that I wanted to make, which are my last points about critical thinking, is that um, if we're asking people to question things, it doesn't always mean there is an easy answer. When we say a student's sentence about the present perfect is correct or incorrect, as teachers, it's nice for us because we know what is right. If we say he have been, it's wrong. With some of the questions that I'm talking about today, we have to remember that it isn't always clear what is the right answer. And another question there I think is important is that you and your opinion, you are not always right. On this, this terrorist question, what you say is not necessarily right. It's your opinion, and you are going to back it up. And your students are going to have maybe different opinions, and they are not wrong because they also have their opinion. As long as they can back up their opinion, 
that I think is our aim as teachers. I'm not sure if that's clear. Can you sort of nod your head? Yeah, you're nodding your heads. Um, teachers are right about the present perfect, but we're not maybe necessarily right about our opinion of every text we use in the classroom. Thirdly, um, critical thinking by students can and should involve students questioning what teachers and texts say. So if a student says like, why did we do that in class? I think that's good. If your students start questioning what you are doing, as long as they're doing it in a nice way, I think that's okay. What we cannot do is encourage critical thinking, but don't critically think about what I'm doing. Yeah, if you think critically, you have to think critically about everything. You can't switch it on and off for the things that you want them to think critically about. Again, could you nod your heads if I'm making sense? It's getting close to lunchtime, so I stopped making sense before lunch. Okay? And um, my last point, which I love this quotation, we all know the expression in English, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So we can teach critical thinking to our students, but they might not want to learn. They might not want to think critically. Um, this is one of my favorite quotations ever about education. At its simplest, schools give young people a place at the water's edge. A horse may not choose to drink if it is led to water, but it cannot drink at all if the water is not there. In other words, if you teach critically critical thinking and they don't seem to be that interested, we still need to do it because some of them will do it, some of them won't do it. But if we don't do it, nobody else will. I think that's part of education, right? If it wasn't for us, and if we gave up because students don't necessarily do it immediately, we would stop teaching the present perfect too. Lovely cartoon here. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So the teacher says, so children, more than to teach, school is to open your minds to the search for information, to stimulate your curiosity, to encourage your quest for answers. Are there any questions? No. It's beautiful, isn't it? And finally, uh, teacher, you opened my eyes to the world and showed me how to question things and think critically. I was happy until I met you. So on that very unhappy note, I'm going to finish. Um, thanks very much for uh, listening. I hope you are enjoying the conference. If you do want to get in touch with me, I always answer to all messages personally at the Teach With Dave Facebook.com website. Thank you very much, and enjoy lunch. Thank you.